Can you hear anything? I've got, let me, I may have to change the setting on here. Can you hear me now? Not at all. What about now? Can you hear it? Nope. Here's the problem. Bluetooth 2VX. I think so too. Well, we're connected to it. It's just. It ought to. It ought to. I don't think it PA would be able to. If it's got Bluetooth capabilities, it could be able to send to a Bluetooth speaker, though. Yeah. That's what he's checking. I think the Bluetooth on there is just like for a microphone in. I don't think it's an out. Yeah. But he's checking. Let me go turn this TV on.
Test, test, test. Don't worry about it. I'll just... Test, test, test. Test, test, test.
71.
us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this, another opportunity we have to come together to worship you. Father, we pray that we would cast the things of this world out of our minds and concentrate on our worship to you, that it would be pleasing in your sight, and we will worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we're so thankful for the blessings that we have each and every day, for the even the air we breathe and all the necessities we have of life. But Father, especially we're thankful for the uh, spiritual blessings that we have that's in and through your son. We're so thankful for him, for his coming to this world, living the perfect life, the examples he have, or the, the word that you've given us, for him dying on that cross that we can have the forgiveness of our sins, and him being raised, and us also having the, the hope of resurrection one day, and we can be in heaven with you when that time is. Father, we are mindful of those that are unable to be out with us, those that are sick and going through different kind of procedures and healing from surgeries. Pray that you would be with them, um, that they might turn to their normal walks of life, that they could return again once with, with us once again. Father, be with those that are mourning the loss of loved ones, that they might be comforted. And Father, we pray that we would continue our, our service and concentrate on our singing and paying attention to the words and also with the Brown President's lesson that we pay attention to the, the words from you from your Bible, from the Bible that's your words and that we would um, pay attention to the story and get the lessons that we can be better servants of yours. Father, we pray that we would take everything that we learn, that we apply them to our lives and be better servants of yours and we could be a lot to those around about us and we would lead other souls to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 22. Number 22. Oh, hey. We're going to be in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20 tonight. Actually, we're going to start in uh, chapter 19 and look at the last uh, three or four verses of that chapter and then move into chapter 20 to, uh, to talk about the end of the uh, rebellion. <clears throat> the story of David's reign as king over Israel uh, started out, you know, with David having to endure uh, a lot of hardship and difficulty in order to become king, and then there were a few years where everything seemed to be okay. He was working to restore things, to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, and preparing to build a, a house for God. And then this uh, time of trouble came with uh, rebellion throughout the land, and it kind of solidified in his son Absalom. Absalom, of course, was finally defeated. He was killed. His uh, coup attempt was, was overthrown. And um, we learned that, of course, that treason doesn't prevail, uh, and it always brings about trouble uh, in this life or the next, and, uh, and Absalom has uh, met his end. And after that, David was, was brought back, and we talked about it in our last lesson, that he returned to be king again over 
Israel. And the way that that restoration was accomplished was, number one, through trust in God, and number two, through patience. David patiently waited for God to do his part, and when the time was right, David was ready to do his. And then he sought unity throughout the land by even forgiving those who had uh, rebelled against him. But what we find out at the uh, end of the story here is that that unity that David was seeking for, it wasn't quite there yet. There was still some trouble that had to be taken care of. And it's an important part of the story because, again, it shows us David's character. It's important because it shows that God is still working to keep his nation the way that he wanted it to be, and he's still in charge. And it's also important because it gives us a foreshadowing of what's to come with the nation of Israel and the division of the kingdom into the northern and southern kingdoms uh, of Israel and Judah. So there are several things that are going on here that we want to look at and talk about. And, uh, and so we want to start at the end of chapter 19. Uh, we left off last time at verse 39 with David coming back across the Jordan River, ready to be king again over Israel. And verse 40 picks up with the end of that uh, story, and it says, Then the king went on to Gilgal, uh, and Kimham went on with him. And all the people of Judah conducted the king and also half the people of Israel. So we remember that David had sent word to the uh, tribe of Judah and asked them why they hadn't invited him back, brought him back to be king. He was their kinsman. They were related by blood. And he said, you should have been the first to ask. And it looks like you're going to be the last. And so they did. Uh, David promised to make a mesa the leader of his army, showing that he was being forgiving toward them. He wasn't seeking vengeance. And so they agreed and, and invited David back. And so that's what's happening here, that the tribe of Judah is kind of leading the way. We saw that there were Benjamites who also were involved in this. And here we find that half the people of Israel were also involved. So the king is crossing the Jordan River, and it's not just David, but it's all those who had been with him, those who were loyal to him. So his entire, you know, he had soldiers and, and families and all of those things. They're all being helped back across the Jordan River, welcomed back to the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem. And it's, it's kind of a procession. You know, this is his triumphant return uh, as king. But what happens here is that the leaders of Judah are, are kind of taking the lead in this. And the leaders of the land of Israel get upset about this. And we'll talk about some reasons why, but, but they don't necessarily like what is, uh, what is happening. So in verse 41, the Bible says, Behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said unto the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen thee away, and have brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over Jordan? So, David's being brought back to be king. Judah is taking a, a leading role in this. And now the men of Israel say, uh, you're stealing the king from us. We should have been the ones to bring the king back to, to Israel. Or at least we should have been involved in it. Uh, maybe they're saying, you know, we all should have done this, you know, together as a nation. Uh, the problem is, of course, that they've been very slow to try to bring David back. Verse 40 talks about the people of Israel, and verse 41 talks about the men of Israel. And there's a difference between those two groups. The people of Israel, that's the people, the, the common man. And many of them had not rebelled against David. Many of them still, still saw him as the king, and they were approving of his return. But the men of Israel seems to refer to the elders of these tribes, the leaders, those who had joined in with Absalom. And so those who were in rebellion against David, so they weren't very quick to welcome him back for fear of, of you know, being punished for their role in the, uh, in the rebellion or, or whatever it was. They had been slow to respond. Judah had acted first, and so naturally they are leading and bringing David back. Well, now everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. If the king's coming back, we should have been involved because we want him back just as much as you did. So they're trying to say, we've always been for David as well, and so we should have been involved in this. So it's kind of an attempt to, to save face and also an attempt maybe to 
thank David that they're not against him, so he won't punish them. Uh, but it becomes this division uh, in the land of Israel. So the men of Judah have to respond. Verse 42 says, All the men of Judah, so these are the leaders of Judah, answered the men of Israel, Because the king is near of kin to us, wherefore then be ye angry for this matter? Have we eaten at all of the king's cost, or hath he given us any gift? So they say, we haven't done anything wrong. He, he's our kinsman. That's why we were taking this role and bringing him back. And they say, uh, you know, you have no reason to be angry. And they make the point that it's not to get some kind of favor from David. We're not eating of his food. He hasn't given us anything. And there's kind of a, a subtle little dig in there because Saul had done a lot of things for his tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. And they kind of bragged about Solomon, or Saul rather, was from our tribe, and look at these things he did for us. Um, and so the men of Judah are saying, you know, that's not what we're doing with David. But it, it becomes this argument. And it's interesting when, when you look at the words here in the original, it's, it's I and me and my over and over again. The people of Israel say, I did this and I want that and me and my and the men of Judah say me and my and I it's all about themselves and their own self-interest and no one's talking about what's right for the nation as a whole and no one's talking about what God wants they're not arguing from the standpoint of we're doing this because this is what God said they each have their own motivations whether it's economic or political or whatever and this is tearing them apart from one another. So verse 43, the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king, and we have also more right in David than ye. Why then did ye despise us that our advice should not be first, be first had in bringing back our king? And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So the Israelites say, well, we have ten tribes, and you're only Judah. You only have one. If Benjamin's with them, that's, that's two. They're saying, we have ten tribes, so we have more right to determine who's the king than you with, with your two tribes. And so, again, it's what men say instead of what God says. God chooses the king. He determines who's going to lead. And the responsibility of all the tribes was to submit to the will of God. But that's not what they're doing, and they're using these human reasonings and, and human arguments to say, we're better than you, no, we're better than you, and we pick the king, and no, we pick the king, and they're going back and forth. And the last verse there says, when Judah answered, it was even more fierce than what Israel had said. And that's showing us that the argument is escalating, the division is escalating, and this is going to lead to trouble in Israel. Now, David's going to deal with this here, and he's going to solve the problem, but it's only going to be temporary. After the reign of Solomon, when, when Rehoboam is to be the new king, we know the story of Jeroboam. And when the nation divides, there are ten tribes that go with the north, Israel, and two with the south, three technically if you count the tribe of Levi. But this division is already present in Israel. It just hasn't become solidified yet. And what David does here to remedy it is important, and it's something that people should have learned from to be able to do the same thing again, but sadly they don't. And eventually the nation divides into those, those two kingdoms. But the roots of it are already present. In fact, they've, they've been present since way back in the time of, of the judges. But anyway, this is the situation that David is going to have to uh, deal with if he wants to be king again, and to reign over a kingdom in peace and unity. So how's he going to do that? Well, we notice in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 20 that even as David is trying to do the right thing and trying to lead God's people in the right way, uh, there's always someone to cause trouble. It's kind of like when you defeat one problem, two more show up. And he fixes this problem, and then there are two more. And it almost seems that he can never, never get ahead. But he's going to. It just takes time and faith and trust in God. So here's what happens in verses 1 and 2. It says, There happened to be there a man of Belial, and uh, that basically means a, a worthless man. This was a man who had no morals, no standards. Uh, he was only out for himself, and uh, he would do whatever 
you know, whatever he wanted to or whatever he had to for his own power and his own glory. He didn't care what God said. He didn't care what the law was. He was going to do what he wanted to do. So he's a reprobate. That word in the New Testament, reprobate, that's what it means, worthless. And we need to understand that when God says that someone has become worthless, that's a serious charge because God creates us and we're created in his image and, and people in the image of God are not worthless. But when we throw our lives away in things that are against God and that have no moral value in them and that becomes our whole life, then, then we become worthless. And that doesn't mean we can't repent and come back and God certainly seeks that. But it's a serious charge. And that's what's said about uh, this man here, a man of Belial. His name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet, the shofar, and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan, even unto Jerusalem. So here's a man who, uh, who's an agitator. He sees an opportunity to stir up trouble. Uh, there's this argument going on, and he sees it as an opportunity to gain position or influence or power for himself. And so now's his time to speak up. So he blows the trumpet, and he says, We don't have anything to do with David. We have no inheritance with David or the son of Jesse. Now, when he says that, what is he saying? We don't have to listen to what God says. God chose David to be king. God has put David back on the throne. And Sheba says, we don't have to listen to God. So if you want to listen to God and stay with God's king, you know, then you stay with David. But if you want to do your own thing, if you want to make your own kingdom, if you want to have things your way, then follow me. Now, he's not going to get very far with this, but this is just the first drop in the water, if you will, of what becomes Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam is going to create a new kingdom with a new worship, with a new temple and a new priesthood and new uh, gods with, with the, the golden calves. Everything that the people wanted, their own religion, their own nation, their own laws. But this is the beginning of it. And Sheba would have done it if he could have gotten away with it. But, but there was a strong leader in David who kept it from happening. But this is, you know, just a glimpse of what's coming. And it's important, you know, to remember how these things happen uh, in the world. They come back around time and time again, and you always have to be on guard against them. So the people listen to uh, Sheba, and the people of Israel, the men of Israel, they leave David and go back home to the north. But the men of Judah, they held on to David. So again, we see this division that's going to come to fruition uh, with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Now, in verse 3, there's this um, little insert here about David um, being a king and, and doing the right thing and, and following the will of God, even in very difficult situations. It says, David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in, uh, in ward, and fed them, but went not in unto them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living in widowhood. So those ten concubines that David had left behind when he was exiled, we remember what happened to them. Absalom came in and took them to be his wives and publicly did that before the nation of Israel to show that he was the rightful king and he had uh, the power and so forth. Well, now Absalom's dead and David has come back and here are these concubines of his. But he couldn't take them back to be his wives because they had been married to Absalom, if you will. And so David doesn't just kick them out and, and run them off and say, uh, you know, because this happened to you, you're no good anymore. Instead, he provides a place for them, and he provides uh, everything that they'll need to live out their rest, the rest of their lives. And they'll do so as widows, because they don't have the right to marry again. Uh, so they're technically Absalom's widows till they die. But David takes care of them and provides for them. He doesn't go in unto them. He doesn't sin with them as Absalom did. But he doesn't just ignore them or, or forget them. 
And so David cared for these women, obviously, and, and he's going to take care of them. And again, I, it shows us the heart of David, the kind of man that he was. He's doing God's will, but he's doing it in a compassionate and, and loving way to take care of them. And then you kind of turn the coin over and, and you see the other side of what David had to do as king. And that is that Sheba has to be taken out. He cannot be allowed to continue this rebellion against the, the king of Israel. So the rest of this chapter, basically, to the last three or four verses, has to do with this, uh, this attempt to kill Sheba and to stop him from, uh, from this rebellion. And it's a fascinating story. So we're going to read starting in verse 5 and talk about what happens here and hopefully learn some things from it. So verse 5 says, uh, so Amasa went to assemble... Uh, the men, I'm sorry, verse 4. Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble me the men of Judah within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. So we remember that Amasa had been the captain of Absalom's army. David appointed him captain of his army, demoting Joab and putting Amasa in his place. And it was an attempt to put Joab in his place and at the same time to mend fences with those who had been following Absalom to show that David wasn't uh, trying to, to destroy them. So Amasa has this new position as captain of, of David's army. David tells him to go throughout the land and to assemble the militia of Judah and you have three days and then we have to hunt down Sheba. So Amasa goes but after three days... He hasn't returned. So we're not told why. We don't know what happened, if the people didn't want to come, um, if David maybe thought Amasa was not being true to him. We, we just don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But for whatever reason, he didn't accomplish what he was supposed to in that time limit in three days. So David had another plan, his plan B. And that's what in verse, uh, verse 6 we read about. It says that David said to Abishai, now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do, more, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men, uh, and the Carathites, and the Pelathites, and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So the army hasn't been raised and hasn't gotten there yet. So David says to uh, Abishai, take my bodyguards and take my mighty men and go find Sheba, you know, and kill him. We have to stop this. And so that's what they're doing. So you have Amasa out here in the land trying to raise an army, and now you have Abishai with David's loyal, uh, you know, most dedicated and, and mighty soldiers. They're also pursuing Sheba. And eventually these two groups come together. So in verse 7, it says, before we read that, uh, notice that it says there, uh, Joab's men. These were men who had for many, many years been under the authority of Joab. He was their captain. And because of that, many of them were very loyal to Joab. They should have been loyal to David, but they were loyal to, uh, to Joab. And that's going to be a problem. But they're called Joab's men because of that. So verse 8 says, when they were at the great stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa went before them. And uh, so the, the two groups come together. Amasa has showed up. Um, whether or not he had his, has an army with him, we don't know. It seems like there were some with him, uh, but we're not told for sure. But anyway, he shows up there. And the Bible says Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins in the sheath thereof. And as he went forth, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again. And he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So what does Joab do? Well, he does what he, what he does best. He assassinates somebody else. And notice how he does it here. He, he's walking up to, uh, to Amasa in friendship, uh, welcoming him, and he's going to greet him. And as he's walking up there, 
he accidentally drops his sword. You know, it just happens to fall out of the sheath. This is the captain of, of the army. You know, he's been captain for years. You don't drop your sword. It doesn't just fall out of the sheath. But he makes it look like it accidentally fell out. And as he's going to, to embrace Amasa, he bends down to pick up his sword. And when he stands up to hug him, he rams it into him and kills him. But he doesn't just kill him. He, he smites him under the fifth rib and cuts him open so that, you know, his guts come out. But he doesn't deliver the death blow. He doesn't strike him again. He leaves him lying on the ground, wallowing in his blood in sheer agony, and he walks off and leaves. We'll read the rest of the passage here. It says in verse 11, one of Joab's men stood by him and said, I'm sorry, yeah, said, He that favoreth Joab, and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in blood in the midst of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So, so this is Joab. Uh, this is not a nice guy. Um, how dare Amasa take his place as captain of David's army? That was Joab's place and his position, and he wasn't going to allow it to happen. So whatever he had to do, that's what he would do, even if it meant assassinating this, this person that was appointed by the king. So Joab has always been a snake, and, and he's always been... Do, seeking his own will and doing his own thing and, and causing trouble. And sometimes David realizes it and sometimes he doesn't. And now he's, he's murdered someone else. So he murdered um, Abner, he murdered Absalom, and now he's murdered uh, Amasa. It's almost like he's going alphabetically down the list. Of all these people that get in his way, he's just going to take them out. And David eventually is going to figure this out. But, but Joab's going to cause trouble for still a long time in the land of Israel. And uh, we're going to have a lesson just talking about him uh, before too long. Uh, but kind of keep in mind uh, the character of, of this man. So he leaves Amasa just suffering in the highway. And it's, it's shocking even to these soldiers. You think about these soldiers who have been in so many battles. And they see not just that Joab murdered him in cold blood but that he did it so cruelly to just leave him there in agony, suffering, and not putting him out of his misery. And uh, this man who's trying to get everybody you know, to come on, when the, the army comes by and everybody who gets there sees this guy laying there suffering and dying, and they stop, and they won't go forward. So he has to drag him off in a field and cover him, him up so people can't see him. So it's a terrible situation, but again, it's to show us the character of, of Joab, the kind of person that he was. So finally now they're chasing down Sheba. And verse 14 says, He went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Maacah and all the Berites. And they were gathered together and went also after him. And so he pursues Sheba all the way to Abel. And Abel is all the way in the far north of the land of Israel. This is uh, in, in the tribe of Dan, that northern tribe, that territory that they took. Uh, not too far from the city of Dan. So they've gone from Jerusalem chasing this man all the way to as far north as you can go uh, in the land of Israel. Some interesting things about that is that when you got up into that region, you remember that the tribe of Dan, they were supposed to settle down in the south, and half of them did, and the other half in the time of the judges, they decided they wanted to uh, start their own city, their own tribe. And so they went up to the north and they found this group of peaceful people that didn't have weapons, they didn't fight, they, they, they wouldn't go into battle, and the tribe of Dan just went in and slaughtered them and stole their land. They had no right to do it, no authority from God to do it, but they wanted to. And along the way they stole a priest and made their own priesthood and all those things. Well, these are those people. They're as far away from Jerusalem as you can get and still be in the land of Israel, but they have no connection to Jerusalem. They don't care who the king is. They don't care what the law is. They don't care what God says. And this is where Sheba has come to. And so now he's being pursued by Joab, who's taken charge of the army. 
and they finally caught him at this city. So verse 15 says, They came and besieged him in Abel of Bethmechah, and they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So you have two things going on. They're building a ramp so they can go over the walls of the city. And then you have others who are, it seems like they're digging under to try to knock down part of the wall. They're trying any way they can to get into the city. Verse 16 says, Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say I pray you unto Joab, Come near hither that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in uh, old times, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And so this wise woman seems to have some kind of leadership in, in the city. She's certainly a woman of influence. And um, she says, we've been known as wise people, so if you tell me what's going on and what you want, we can probably help you and you don't have to destroy the city. Uh, and he responds to her, verse 20, Joab answered and said, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman saith unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. So notice Joab again. Uh, he says, Far be it from me. This is not my fault. I don't want to destroy your city. This is David's fault. This man did something against David, and David sent us up here to do it. That's the kind of man Joab is. He wants to get rid of anyone who's in his way, but he doesn't want to, to take any blame for anything himself. So he's a snake, and, and, he, and he shows that over and over throughout the story. So he tells her what's going on, and she says, fine, we'll go find the guy and cut off his head and throw it over the wall to you. And they did. Verse 22 says, The woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. So he didn't even have to fight a battle, uh, you know, to take the city or anything like that. <laughs> they, just, they just cut off his head. Uh, there's no trial, you know, there's no searching out, is this the truth or anything like that. Joab says, cut off the guy's head, and they're like, okay, and they do. This kind of people that, that they were. But anyway, Sheba is, is defeated, obviously, and killed, and this stops the rebellion um, in Israel. And so there are a lot of fascinating things about this story, and, and it's a very bloody story. But the great lesson, the, the you know, overreaching lesson that we, we have to notice is, first of all, that David had to be a decisive king. What had happened with Absalom had fomented this division in the land, and the time had come for that to stop. David was the rightful king of Israel. God had put him on the throne, and now God was seeking to return him. And there's a time to try to make peace with your enemies, which is what David did to bring unity, to bring the people back together. But when there are those who refuse to have peace, who refuse to have unity, those who refuse the will of God, there comes a time when you have to stand against them and they have to be silenced. The New Testament teaches us that very same principle, not in physical battle, but in the spiritual battle that we're involved in. There's a time when we are to try to make peace with those who are in error, those who are in sin, those who are against the doctrine of Christ. But the New Testament also says a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. You try once and, and maybe he won't listen. You try again. If he still won't listen and he won't repent, he has to be cut off. The New Testament teaches withdrawal of fellowship. That a person who persists in sin and refuses to repent eventually has to be cut off. There has to be a separation from the congregation acknowledged. 
because of their sin. And it's exactly what God will do to us if we persist in our sins. He cuts us off from himself. And so the cutting off of Sheba's head really kind of demonstrates that he was cut off from God. And, and it's an important principle that we have to remember. We want peace and we want unity, but sometimes the only way to peace and unity is through separation, is through bloodshed here. Spiritually, that bloodshed you know, comes in. When you stand for the truth, there's no room for compromise. And you can't give in to error and you can't give in to sin and let it stand and let it go unchallenged. And that's difficult for us sometimes because it means we have to stand against people and sometimes you hurt people's feelings and, and people get angry and you know all those things that happen. But the truth is the truth and our responsibility is to stand for it. And as much as you know, we, we want peace and, and everyone to be faithful members of the church, there are some who just will not. And we have to stand for what is right, no matter the consequence. And that's what David has done here. He's stood up for God's will. God made me king, and I am king, and this rebellion has to end. And it wasn't going to end through compromise with those who continued to seek to undermine his authority. It had to end with their end. They had to be put down. And it's not pretty. It's a terrible story to read about the horrible things that happened it opens the door for Joab to come back into, into power, and that's going to bring more trouble, but it was something that had to be done. And again, it's an important reminder about the nature of truth and the danger of, of compromise with error and with sin. Now, just real quick, the last verses here in this chapter, verses 23 through 26, I'm not going to read them because of all the, the names that are there, but this is just a list of the people who served under David. There's a similar list to this one in chapter 8, and when you compare chapter 8 here with chapter 20, you find out who has changed positions. There are different people in different positions, and it illustrates that the nation has changed. It's grown, it's larger, there, there are other things taking place. But what it's meant to show us is that David is finally on the throne, his kingdom is organized, he has his servants over their individual responsibilities, and so now the kingdom is at rest, it is at peace. And that peace will continue for about 10 years, give or take a little bit. There will be this period of peace and prosperity uh, in Israel. David's life comes to an end and Solomon comes in as king and he brings the, the greatest peace and prosperity that Israel would ever know with his reign, but not without trouble. Because there in the background, like, like a snake, you know, hiding in the weeds, is, is Joab. And his time of causing trouble isn't quite over yet. But the kingdom has been restored. David is back on the throne, the rightful king. Everything is right with the world, at least for a time. And, uh, you know, it'll last for a little while, but eventually more trouble is, uh, is going to come. So we'll think about these lessons and what we see here in David's life. And, again, think about the, how, what it demonstrates to us about the character of this man no matter what situation he was faced with, how difficult it was, the, the challenge that was posed to him, David always put God first. He always wanted God's will to be done, and that's what he sought. Even, you know, difficult things like with these women who had been basically his wives and how he had to relate to them, even with dealing with Joab and the back and forth with him, uh, having to stand up against an enemy and at the same time trying to make peace with others, all of these things are challenging, but he wanted to do God's will and to serve him above everything else. And that's what he tried to do. And he did a pretty good job of it, uh, even though he was faced with some very difficult situations. And it's something that we need to learn from, from him and from his character, that that ought to be our desire as well. That no matter what challenges we're presented with, what obstacles we face in life, we need to seek God's will first. And when we do, things may not happen quickly. We'll have to be patient. We have to wait on the Lord. But with trust and faith in him and patient endurance, because as a Christian, that's always joined with hope, which is a, a cheerful longing for the promises that God will give us, we can endure and we can overcome. God always accomplishes his will i mean that's the the whole point of of this book is that god wins 
we come to the end of the book of Revelation, and who wins? It's not the devil. It's not those who serve the devil. It's not those who are, are doing evil and striving for evil. It's not the men of Belial, but it's God. And we have to choose to be on his side. That's what David chose. And so whatever obstacle he faced, he knew he had to stay on God's side and everything would be okay. And it was, and it will be for us as well. And so that's the lesson that we need to learn. And I hope that we are all on God's side. The way to be on his side, of course, is to be a part of his family, to be a Christian, to have our sins washed away by the blood of his son. There's an opportunity for you tonight if you need to do that. If there's sin that needs to be made right with God in a public way, you can do that by responding to our Lord's invitation. Become a Christian through faith in Jesus, repentance of sin, confession of the name of Christ, baptism for the remission of sins, or come back home by repenting of your sins, confessing them, and then praying for forgiveness. We'll do whatever we can to help if you'll let it be known. Come forward and respond, even now, as we stand and as we sing. Our sister Jeanette Tittle has come forward tonight, and she's given me this note to read, and I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, she says, I brought reproach upon the church by uh, the way I handled something purchased uh, with our flower fund money. Some members' feelings were hurt by my poor judgment. Um, I do not want to be a stumbling block to anyone. I'm asking for forgiveness for my wrong. She also says she's asking for forgiveness for letting um, the COVID and uh, other things interfere with uh, being a Christian uh, or living as a Christian, uh, as a Christian should. Uh, we appreciate that. And she said, you know, that she's talked to the people uh, involved in this and tried to make it right with them, but she felt it's a public thing and she wanted to make public confession. And we certainly appreciate her uh, wanting to do that, her desire to, to make these things right. And uh, we love Jeanette, all of us, so much and appreciate all the good that she does and her tender heart and we're glad that she has uh, made this statement uh, we're going to have a word of prayer if you'll bow with me at this time <clears throat> our most kind and gracious father in heaven we're so thankful to you for this day of life thankful for the opportunity that we've had to assemble and to worship thee thankful for all the good things that you do for us especially for the gift of your son the hope that we have in him for the forgiveness of our sins and through the cleansing of his blood that we can be pure and clean and holy in thy sight, that we can find forgiveness and salvation and be assured of eternal life with thee in heaven. We're thankful for that great sacrifice, and we're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we can come before thy throne of grace and mercy and seek help in times of need. We pray at this time on behalf of our sister Jeanette Tittle that thou would look down upon her with that mercy and kindness and forgiveness that she may stand pure and clean in thy sight. We're so thankful for her, for her good heart and her desire to make these things right in a public way. And I pray that you'll bless her and give her strength and 
uh, the joy of salvation and of forgiveness again. Uh, we're thankful for the church, thankful that we can be members of it and that we can work and serve together, and we pray always that we will love one another, seek to be united, and work together in that unity and love that we will always bring honor and glory to thy name. Help us to be kind and, and compassionate to one another, forgiving of one another, and always seeking to love one another as you love us. We're so thankful again for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Table remains prepared if there's need those that need to partake of it. Raise your, raise your hand this time. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day for your many blessings, Father. Especially at this time, we're thankful for your son, that his death on that cross. Father, we pray that those that are partaking of this would look at his, remember his death on that cross, and, and take this in a worthy manner. We ask, we ask that you bless this bread to us as Christians, the body that was broken on that cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this cup to us as Christians, the blood that was shed on that cross. Pray that the one taken of it would remember the death on his cross and partake of it in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to see everybody out tonight. If you would, please open your song books, number 341. Number 341 will be our closing song tonight, and following that song, I'll ask Connor, Connor Mitchell to lead our closing prayer. Uh, the only updates on any sick that I have is uh, Tommy Gentle will, should be able to come back home from uh, rehab on or, let's see, next Thursday. He's doing well, but he's still unable to walk, so keep him in your prayers. And uh, please remember, Harold Cohen is in he Helen Keller Hospital and is not doing very well. Um, are there any other sick that need to be mentioned? The only other announcement I have is a gospel meeting at Blackwater, Macedonia this week, and there's more details on that in the bulletin. Uh, are there any other announcements? <clears throat> if not, then let's stand and sing the first and last verse, number 341. God's in his own
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and all our many blessings. I thank you for allowing us to gather here twice today to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Help us to absorb what we've been taught here today and to apply it in our everyday lives. And be with us as we travel from here and throughout the rest of the week. And help us to always remember you and be repentant of the things we've done in our lives that are wrong and that we make, make them right and come back to you. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.